Council back in session. Roll call, please. Mr. Carlson. Here. Maniscalco. Here. Dingfelder. Citro. Here. Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. And Goose. Here. Madam Clerk, for the record, I uh, did receive something from Mr. Dingfelder's office. He will not be joining us from the afternoon session. Thank you. And we have a physical quorum. We have a physical quorum. All right. All right, we've got item number 80 and 81. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. One, one sec, one sec, one sec. Madam Clerk? You said 86 step? Oh, that's right. All right, okay, the clerk just brought that to my team. We, if you ladies will just hold on a few, we're going to finish this last staff item report, and it shouldn't take no more than about 10 minutes. So we're going to get back to you in just about 10 minutes. Okay, thank you so much. All right, item number 86. That should be city staff on item 86. Go. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. You, I think you're muted in the room there. I think you're muted in the room. Now? We got you now. We're good. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Valerie Horton. I am the risk manager for the city of Tampa. And around the table, you have purchasing, you have Mr. Gary Hart, uh, the staff from uh, CAD, and as well as legal. Mr. Greg Spearman will be the person going through the PowerPoint. And uh, may we share our screen? Let me share your screen. Thank you. So good afternoon, Council. This is uh, Greg Spearman, Councilman um, Fair Goods and members of Council. Uh, we'd like to share with you a, a brief PowerPoint this afternoon uh, based upon uh, item number 86. So let's go to the next screen, please. All right, so this is our agenda, Council. We want to talk to you about what is builder's risk insurance, city requirements for contract to builder's risk insurance, what is an in-house builder's risk insurance program, the, the cons and the pros of builder's risk, uh, of an in-house builder's risk insurance program, the city's research on an in-house builder's risk insurance program, the current state of builder's risk insurance for city construction projects, the impact upon the city of implementing an in-house builder's risk program, then we have a summary statement we'd like to share with you. And we also would like to entertain any questions that you might have. Next slide. So what is builder's risk? Builder's risk insurance, also known as contractors all risk insurance, is a special type of property insurance which indemnifies against damage to buildings while they are. Builder's risk insurance is coverage that protects a person's or organization's insurance interest in materials, fixtures, and or equipment being used in the construction or renovation of a building or structure should those items sustain physical loss or damage from a current cause. Hey, Steve, I'm at that. So on phone, uh... can you hear us? Here, good afternoon, Ron Vila with the city of Tampa calling concerning your roof. Um, the, the path that we got. I guess it's somebody's office, I guess. Mute him, his microphone. You mute him? Thank you. All right, thank you. We're sorry about that. We got interrupted. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So now we want to talk about what the city's requirements are for contractors builders risk insurance. Builders risk insurance is required in all construction bids and it's the responsibility of the contractor to provide and to protect the city against risk of loss. The construction contractor is 100% responsible for the risk of loss or damage to equipment, 
materials, theft, property destruction, and supplies during all phases of the construction project. Next slide. So what is an in-house builder's risk insurance program? An in-house builder's risk insurance program would require the city to assume the risk 100% of the responsibilities that would normally be required by the construction contract. Next slide. So what we'd like to do now, Council, is to talk to you about some pros and some cons of implementing an in-house builder's uh, risk program. So as far as the pros are concerned, there may be cost savings, but Without the data from past contracts, it cannot be measured at this time. Secondly, construction contractors may offer some competitive, may offer some competitive bids, savings from some competitive bids, and not having to include builders' risk in their bids to the city. And lastly, an in-house builders risk insurance program may create bid opportunities for smaller firms to offer builders risk match insurance policy to the city. So those are some of the potential pros. Now we want to focus on what some of the cons are. The city assumes 100% of the risk of loss of equipment, materials, and supplies of, of the construction project and claims process. The city would have to increase the number of FTEs in risk management and contract administration to run an in-house program. Any potential cost savings would be offset by having to add resources to manage an in-house program. Next slide. We will also experience high insurance premiums, which could impact the city's bond rating to borrow money at competitive rates. A number of potential claims would increase significantly that will normally be handled at the con as the contract responsibility. We will also experience an increase in claims, which would impact the city's ability to obtain insurance at competitive rates. Next slide. So this next slide basically addresses some of the research initiatives that the staff undertook to investigate uh, in its house builder Swiss insurance program. So staff reviewed the question and spoke with entities around Florida and industry professionals. Risk management could not find any house, any in-house builder Swiss insurance program via, via an inquiry within its professional association. Likewise, purchasing could not find any in-house builder's risk insurance programs via an inquiry within its professional association. However, we did discover that Broward County School Board has an active in-house builder's risk insurance program. Broward County's program was based on five years worth of data, which compared the cost of contractor provided builder's risk insurance to the cost of the school board's master insurance policy, data which the city of Tampa does not have. Palm Beach County did have an insurance risk program, but it was allowed to sunset. Now we also contacted, so that one slide. We also contacted the Tampa Aviation Authority. Uh, we did validate that they do not have an insurance, uh, building assistance insurance program. USF has a limited in-house Builders Risk Insurance Program, but it's limited to less projects less than $4 million, um, and it also is limited to under five projects per year. Let's continue on with the next slide. The Risk Management Division contacted the city's broker who indicated that it is not common practice for public entities to hold their own builders risk policies. Madrid, the city's broker, reviewed 30 municipalities, none of which currently own a master builder's risk policy. Well, let's talk about the current state of builder's risk for city construction projects. There are 25 current construction projects in contract administration that require builder's risk insurance. Each builder's risk program is managed by the general contractor, not the city. The city of Tampa currently has limited data for the impact of changing the current process. As previously mentioned, one Florida entity, Broward County School System, collected five years worth of data before making a decision to move on to an in-house builder switch program, data which the city of Tampa does not have. The insurance brokers currently attached to the city's insurance program 
on McGriff Insurance and A Plus Accuracy Insurance Agency. And this is an independent city certified black business enterprise. Next slide. So let's talk about the impacts of implementing a builder's risk insurance policy in house. First of all, the city of Tampa would be seeking new coverage, which would require the collection of loss data for the three prior years of project losses, cost type, and other pertinent information for underwriters to make determinations of risk and cost of coverage. Secondly, the city has 17 different policies which renew once per year. It takes about six months each year to manage this process. Based on insurance acquisition requirements, month reporting on 25 ongoing projects or more, and the claims management process, the city would need to hire at least two additional insurance staff at risk management and possibly one to two additional staff in contact administration. This number would be impacted by the number of open projects requiring coverage. So on this last slide, we have a summary statement for you. Implementing an in-house building switch program shifts significant responsibility from the contractor to the city. This is risk and responsibility from the contractor to the city. Without any historic cost data on construction bids for builder's risk insurance costs to the city, it is difficult, very difficult to determine if a master builder's risk insurance policy would actually save the city money. A higher number of claims could possibly negatively impact the city. And lastly, the city's total FTE count of risk management and contract administration would be increased. So with that council, we have, as Ms. Valerie Harden rates uh, mentioned at, at our opening, we have legal, we have uh, contract administration, equal business opportunity. Answer any questions you might have. All right. I, I've heard a lot of what we can't do. So, uh, and I heard about the master plan and, and the FTE, but I didn't know what we can do. What can we do on a smaller scale? Uh, heard a lot about what we can't do. I'm looking for an idea on a smaller scale because there are people are out there asking these questions and are constantly calling me about this. Uh, and when I hear that, folks, this has been done, I know we, we, we don't want to bring liability to the city, but I didn't know on a small scale what can we do? Because I believe we can do something to be able to help some of these smaller uh, businesses be able to work within the city. Ms. Spear? Uh, risk management? Uh, uh, what, 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 uh, our council, I think what we're trying to convey is that we simply don't have the data at this point. Um, one of the problems that I mentioned during the presentation of Broward County School System, before they actually implemented their program, they had collected five years worth of data. And they were able to compare the cost of builder's risk insurance and their construction bids to what it would cost to have a master policy. And where we are now is that we simply don't have the data to make that comparison. That's, that's what we're seeing. I see the chief of staff has come on. Maybe he has a, an idea. Maybe he can, can shed some light on this. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. I want to thank staff for assembling and giving the pro and con risk evaluation to a master builder's policy. But, you know, we're, as we've talked, we're a city with imagination and we're a city that tries to help small businesses get across certain barriers. And we've talked about that in the equal business opportunity space. So with council's permission and no motion necessary, I'd like to meet with this team and possibly some, or maybe develop an RFI in this space and see if there is something that we can look at, especially if it's hindering small businesses from performing. Uh, we've talked about other insurance and other barriers from, from allowing businesses to do business with the city. And that's the part I'm really concerned about. If this becomes a, if this is a barrier for some of those smaller contracts, like we heard about with USF, and we can use some of their data to uh, evaluate a program, I would like to work offline and then maybe come back to council in the next 90 days and, and give a report and see what we can do. 
Chief, thank you for coming on. And, and that, I think that is the problem, some of the smaller people trying to get in and get some work and be sustainable. Um, and we always look at the big people, but the smaller people have to work too. So uh, I, I gladly entertain that. I look forward to you come back. The presentation was great, but I was looking for a little what we can do. I'm glad you came on. I hope get more discussion. We can kind of help those folks that have been calling me see what we can do to help them out. So I can, I can be able to the 90 days. And, and what I would just do is we'll target one of your workshops, Councilman, and we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll put something on a workshop for your approval. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions, gentlemen? All right. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for coming on, Chief. Anytime. Thank you, Council. Thank you, team. Thank, Thank you, Council. All right. We got our past our 130 hour gentleman. Still with good timing, I believe. Uh, item number 80. Ah, open the public here. Second. All right, Mr. Maniscalco, second by Mr. Manaranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. We're open. Item number 80. Mr. Chairman, Martin Direct Shelby, I'm sorry. Before we begin with regard to both of these hearings, um, I believe that the um, <clears throat> uh, material that council has received uh, has been uploaded into um, the city's uh, system and made part of the record. Just a reminder, council, if there have been any ex parte communications relative to these hearings, that you do de yeah, disclose yeah, them prior to us <laughs> moving forward. And also, Council, I would remind the public that they should not contact the Council members relative to quasi-judicial matters and um, during, the, um, during the hearings. And uh, Council, if you do receive anything or see anything that you um, uh, notify um, uh, the clerk and, and me um, so we can actually um, address that issue. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, Kamaria pettis Macker from the City Attorney's Office. Um, Mr. Chair, um, previously I handed, um, provided City Council members um, for this item, item number 80, which is VRB 21-123 for the property located at 1712 West Diana Street. I handed City Council the relevant code sections, which are 27-80, 27-11, I handed uh, out a formal decision that was uh, made in reference to this property, um, sample motions and the rules of procedure. We're here this afternoon to, um, based upon a petition for review that was filed by the property owner, Carlos Hayune. Uh, Mr. Hayune um, asked, is asking city council to overturn the variance review board's decision to deny a variance request. Um, the various review board um, heard the various requests, which was to reduce a side yard, the west setback, from seven feet to 1.4 feet. That decision by the VRB to deny the various requests was heard on October 12th of 2021. Um, the various review board de decided, uh, made a decision that the applicant, the property owner, did not meet the hardship criteria as established in code section. 27-80 that is in your packet. Before discussing the um, standard of 20, code section 27-80, I did want to inform um, city council that um, staff previously um, made a decision, um, a formal decision regarding a lot split for this property. And that specific uh, formal decision is in FDN 21-130. That staff letter is in your packet. Specifically, the property owner asked staff to determine whether or not um, uh, they could, the owner could create three conforming uh, lots or three compliant RS-50 zoning lots for his property. Mm -hmm. um, as Mr. Cotton will explain, he um, approved uh, the lot split with the condition that the property owner um, either obtain a variance regarding the existing structure that is on lot B or to demolish the structure that is on lot B. The applicant and the property owner decided to request a variance regarding that existing structure on lot B, which is why the property was before the various review board. 
As I previously stated, it's the applicant and the property's owner's burden to pr 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 prove a hardship. As I provided in your packet, code section 27-80 states, and this year, these are the elements that the property owner has to prove. One, that the alleged hardships or practical difficulties are unique and singular with respect to the property or with respect to a structure or building thereon, and are not those suffered in common with other property structures or buildings similarly located. Two, the hardship or practical difficulty does not result from the actions of the applicant. A self-created hardship or practical difficulty shall not justify a variance. Three, the variance if granted will not substantially interfere with or injure the health, safety, or welfare of others whose property would be affected by allowance of the variance. Four, the variance is in harmony with and serves the general intent and purpose of this chapter in the adopted Tampa Comprehensive Plan. And five, allowing the variance will result in substantial justice being done considering both the public benefits intended to be secured by this chapter and the individual hardships or practical difficulties that will be suffered due to a failure of the board to grant a variance. As Mr. Cotton will explain uh, regarding the formal decision, the applicant chose to request a lot split for three lots as opposed to two lots. Additionally, the applicant chose to go um, ask the variance review, review board for a variance as opposed to demolishing an existing uh, structure. Um, again, it's the applicant's burden and the petitioner's burden to prove a hardship and a self-created hardship or a decision from the staff does not provide a hardship for this um, application. And with that, um, um, for the review hearing, City Council conducts a de novo standard of review. That means the City Council can um, uh, accept new evidence, take testimony, um, and make a decision to determine whether or not the applicant makes, meets the hardship criteria in Code Section 27-80. Um, as previously stated, um, Jane Madu will be able to provide the historical um, uh, information regarding the variance that was requested from the VRB, and Mr. Cotton will be able to explain the formal decision. Upon conclusion of hearing the evidence, City Council can affirm the decision of the Variance Review Board. City Council can remand this matter back to the Variance Review Board with direct specific instructions to consider. And finally, uh, City Council can overturn the Variance Review Board and therefore grant the variances that were requested, that are requested by this application, by this uh, property owner. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Cotton if he can explain the formal decision to City Council. Thank you, Tor, Mr. Chair. We on Jane and I need to be sworn in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Council. So the applicant applied for a formal decision. The formal decision process was created um, in around 2010 by the legal department to process lot splits instead of having all creations of lots go before city council. So in this case, the applicant came before staff proposing three lots. Each lot would meet the underlying zoning requirements of the RS60 district, the, um, excuse me, the RS50 district, minimum five size of 50 feet of width, 5,000 square feet. The, the issue for the applicant is that there's an existing, um, may I share my screen? I don't have a proposed, um, I just wanna show this survey of the existing property and, and Jane will go in greater detail of this. Thank you. Um, do you see the survey? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is the, this is one of the new proposed lots. This is parcel B. You can see the existing structure on it. So as part of the condition of approval, the applicant was offered the, uh, you know, he could either A, demolish the structure and rebuild new in compliance with the RS50 standards, or you could apply for a variance to reduce the side yard, the newly created side yard from seven feet down to 1.4 feet. As Ms. pettis Mackle indicated, the applicant decided to go before the variance review board. So, What's um, the, sh the, the long and the short of it is he needs, he, he requested to go before the VRB 
and, sh and show that he had a hardship of the property. Um, not to take the thunder away from Jay, and he made his argument, and the board voted against his request. All that being said, this is an ongoing issue. With there are times when people come before us, they want to split their lot. Sometimes they have a foot, sometimes they have four feet, sometimes they have six feet. They do need to to become a conforming lot. They need to take care of the encroachment, whether through a demolition, a variance, or design exception. Um, just so, so council is aware, staff is going to be coming forward with the text amendment to 27-11, which would allow, at council's pleasure, of course, to allow the zoning administrator to recognize existing setbacks, to allow for lots to be split, but without having to require the person to get another process, either a variance or a design exception. Um, does council have any questions regarding the, the process that I went through to grant the, grant the lot split? Any questions, Mr. Scott? You may proceed, sir. No questions. Hey, thank you. I'm now going to let Jane take over. Thank you. Permission to share my screen? Good afternoon to the council. My name is Jane Amadu with Development Coordination. And um, this is item number 80, VRB case 21-123C. And this is before City Council today um, for review hearing um, regarding the VRB decision for the property address at 1712 West Diana Street. Um, it's, okay. The petitioner today is Carlos Huyanay, and um, this property is zoned residential single family RS50, and the various request was to reduce the side yard setback on the west side from seven feet to 1.4 feet for an existing single family residence. And the code um, requirement was from section one, um, 27156, which provides the schedule of area height and bulk placement for the zoning category for the RS50. It has to be 20 feet in the front, seven feet on the sides, and uh, 20 feet in the rear. This uh, application was brought before the review board. The board had the case on October 12, um, 2021, as um, the legal counsel has already stated. And after the testimony, the request uh, was denied with a vote of five to zero. So it was a unanimous um, vote. Um, council already um, addressed this, uh, but in the decision, the VRB board um, was governed by the criteria stated in section 27-80. And um, legal has already got over, gone over that um, extensively. So this is the subject property highlighted in the area. Um, it's a corner lot um, with uh, West Diana and an undeveloped um, right of way to the east side. That is not Carroll Street, and that is the um, property in question and. In, in this highlighted portion, we're seeing um, three lots before they were split. Now, this is uh, this shows those three lots as they have been split: parcel A, parcel B, and parcel C. Eric already went over the different um, uh, with went over the decision for the formal decision and how um, that was done. Uh, the variance is regarding parcel B. Now, this is the site plan that the applicant provided to staff, um, showing that existing structure highlighted in blue with the hatch, and it, that has been blown up on this side, so you can see that on the narrowest part of the structure, the setback is 1.4 feet, and on the least narrow part is at 1.8 feet, and the red shows what that property line is, and that's what the variance request was for. Um, the applicant also provided pictures showing the existing home. Um, and even though this is not as um, clear to see what that property line is, it's somewhere about where that fence is. The picture on the top right corner is the front view from the street showing you the existing property. And here you're seeing kind of like the line that straddles the existing um, 
home on lot uh, on parcel B and the newly created lot on parcel A. Still pictures showing this. So technically the property line will kind of line line up with this fence where it is currently. And those were the pictures that the applicant provided showing the um, existing condition of the site. Staff will be available for any questions. Any questions? Just to share a fine you recognize? Uh, we have all three lots. Were they at 5,000 square feet? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I, I couldn't hear the question. I said, were, I asked, were all three lots that were split, were they at 5,000 square feet? Yes, they are. If so could just I, answer. I, I guess, let, let me rephrase my question then. Is parcel A and parcel B at 5,000 square feet? Or more. Eric Cotton, development coordination. Yes, um, Councilman, they both meet. To do a formal decision to, to create lots, you must meet the underlying zoning. They must meet the 50 feet of width and the 5,000 square feet each. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, all right, we'll hear from the applicant. Sworn in, sir? I'm sorry. Um, was you just sworn in? I did swear in. But okay, you want to swear all again? right. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. All right, you state your name, sir. You can begin. Carlos Wayanai. All right, so you can begin uh, your statement anytime. Uh, yes, sir. Like uh, we have seen all the slides and the drawing and the pictures. There usually were four lots facing Carroll Street. Carroll Street is uh, non improved road, so I cannot build the properties facing that way. The original structure house that is on parcel B has been there for quite a while, so I decided to split the four lots into three lots parcel A, B, and C. And now I wanted to build a property on parcel A. And I was given the the formal decision result that I can do that, provided that I apply for a variance from seven feet to 1.4, and the shortest part of the line from partial A to part B and the structure is 1.4. So I'm pretty much asking the board to uh, consider that because that's within the parameters of that one of the requirements. Anything else, sir? Well, if you need me to show you any more pictures, any more plans, that I can do that. But um, that's what pretty much I'm asking the board to allow me to uh, continue with the process of splitting the lot because after this, we will be the uh, the address for the lots, the um, the um, what is it called? It will be called the uh, folio number to be assigned, pending on this. Um, I already have all the documents from the appraisal office, and just everything is pending to this form of the, uh, to this setback from 7 to 1.4. All right. Anything else, sir? Uh, nothing else, sir. Anything for the gentleman? Uh, just on Ready. the partial, I'm just trying to, uh, this is a de novo, which is a new hearing. What made you build the structure how you did? How, well, the, the property was there already. Like I was saying, the, the lots were facing Carroll Street, facing eastbound and westbound. So when I bought the property, it was four lots facing Carroll Street. Now, the house was already built there, and I went and decided to split the four lots into three because I cannot build the houses facing Carroll Street because the road is not improved. And the city told me that they cannot improve or they cannot put asphalt on that road, so I had to uh, be, uh, reconfigure the lots. So that's why I created A, B, and C. And I'm planning on build the property on parcel A, but everything is pending on the setback. The house so you're is saying there. that you can, if you had four lots, you can build 
Four no, different. I cannot. I cannot because the road is not improved. I can. The, the lots will be facing Carroll Street, which is the west side of east side of the property. I cannot build the houses facing Carroll Street because that road is not improved, and uh, so that way I have to from four lots I had to come come down to three in order to build one house because the other on parcel C I cannot even build it. That's going to be there until the road gets improved. But you were the one that built the the the. the the building in the back, am I correct? The uh, property that is on parcel B, it, it was there when I purchased the, prop the property, the house, when I purchased the lot. And uh, parcel C is empty, just uh, trees and and nothing else. I cannot even do anything with it. It's gonna be a blank lot for a while until Carroll Street gets improved. What I read here is lot 22, 23, and part of 24. You don't own all of 24, am I correct? Right, I owe, I owe all four. All four. 22, 23, 24, and which now is going to be reconfigured to... Uh, what about 25? You said you own four lots. Yes, 25, sorry. So you own 22, 23, 24, and 25. That is correct, sir. And, and your the, the dwelling that you live in now is in 25? No, the dwelling that is is 22, 23, and I don't think I don't think it goes to 24. But it is one of the uh, drawing that the lady showed. It had the last configuration from previous one. I don't have it handy, or maybe I do. Yeah, I don't have it. So this is what I have so far. But the lot was. The house is here, 22, 23, 24, 25 goes a long ways to the Carroll Street. So, like I say, I can't do anything because this is an improved road. So I had to turn around and split the lots uh, and make them A, B, and C. All of them are over 5,000 square foot on uh, dimensions, and even this C lot is bigger, but I can't do nothing there because it's facing Carroll Street, and uh, I, I, I'm just losing a lot because I can't do anything with it. I'm trying to build a property here for my family and myself, uh, facing to that one. I mean, next to the other one. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. Chair, just as a, Kamari pettis from the city attorney's office, just as a, a, a reminder, um, we're here because the applicant is requesting a petition for review from the variance review board who decided that the applicant did not meet the hardship criteria. The board specifically uh, determined that um, the lot split was a process that the applicant or the property owner decided to go through. He decided to split the lots three ways in order to develop on parcel A. Um, certainly, as Mr. Cotton explained, he could have processed a smaller, uh, a smaller lot split for maybe two lots to avoid the need for a variance. But just because staff approved a lot split does not provide the basis for a hardship. He, the applicant, still has the burden to, to explain the hardship and meet the hardship criteria as established in code section 27-80. And with that, I'll ask if to follow the, the process if the applicant has any other final remarks. If I'm, Mr. Cotton. Mr. Cotton, you there? Yes, sir. I was muted. <laughs> so the, 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 the whole issue centers around the house that's on the property now. Correct. If that house was not there, the lot split, could, the, we wouldn't even hear, be here about the lot split. Correct. The lot split would have been administratively approved. Thank and there would have been no condition sure. regarding the existing structures. All right. 
Uh, I think the applicant was finished. So anybody on the second floor to speak on this item? Can't hear you, um, sir. Anyone on the second floor to speak on this item? I'm sorry. No, there's no additional speakers. All right. Anyone just raise for, it? Just for clarity. No one is raised. So then if the applicant had made a choice to only have a split of two lots, not three, would it satisfy the needs of all involved? Meet the satisfaction of the city's zoning laws and building area and so forth and so on. Is that a question for staff? Yes, if Mr. Cotton can just confirm that if the applicant asked for a two lot split, there would not be a need for a variance. He wouldn't be here today. Yes and no, um, Eric Cotton, Development Coordination. Yes and no. If I may share my screen again, I want to show an aerial of the, of the area. So, well, you should see the aerial on the, pro this is the property in question. This is the existing structure. This property right here, um, Mr. The, Cotton, this is the, Mr. Cotton, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that it was blown up before you spoke so you could see it now. Oh, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. So as, as the petitioner was talking about, this is Carol. This is an unimproved right of way. This is parcel C. So parcel C cannot be developed until either the petitioner puts in the road or the city puts in the road. This is parcel B where the existing encroachment is. This is parcel A. Parcel mm -hmm. A just is at 50 feet. So there's no way to create a smaller lot unless the applicant went through the plan development process, came before city council and requested a reduction in the frontage to have a smaller lot. And a lot that was 45 by the depth of the property and come before council that way. Um, if if the with the existing structure on here, there is the only would have been a, a lot split for this property and for the property that's called parcel C that doesn't currently have any access to it. So that's why the proposal was conditioned upon either this being demolished or him obtaining a variance. Mr. Mr. Chair, recognize then Mr. Cotton, uh, the the yes, proposed lot to the south. Yes, sir. That is still not going to be developed and developable until there is a right of way or a road going Correct. down there, an entrance going Correct. down the there. The, road, the right of way has to be improved from Diana to at least the point of the driveway. The city currently has no plans on in, in, in putting in this roadway. So the lot will remain vacant or the petitioner could, you know, invest in, in improve the roadway on its own to city standards. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Scott. You're welcome. All right. There was no one on the second floor to speak for this item. There was no registered person to speak for this item. Mr. Chairman. You recognize. Yes, thank you. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney, if you can give the petitioner a last word to address yes, what's was. just been talked about. Yes, I was. Thank you, sir. And just just before that, just before that, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Kamari pettis from the City Attorney's Office. Um, I just, again, wanted to reiterate what Mr. Cotton, you know, further go into what Mr. Cotton was stating is that this lot split is a process that the applicant chose to, to go through. Um, again, it's the bur applicant's burden is to describe the hardship that's unique and singular to that property that he's asking the variance for. Um, it, it's not about um, something that was approved by staff, but it's about what establishing for the record what is unique and singular to that property on parcel B in order to ask for the variance. The lot split is the process that the applicant chose to go through and as such, it's his burden to show what is unique and singular with that property. And creating a lot split does not give him an automatic grounds to um, have to meet the hardship criteria. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the explanation. 
Okay, we'll go back to the applicant for any type of rebuttal. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm going to show my screen. Okay. On my screen, I have the statement of uh, hardship. And it stated that uh, one, the former assistant was running and creating, like Mr. Cotton said, provided that I get the seven feet to one four. The main reason is I have my parents living on the property. I have uh, changed the roof on that property. I have uh, installed the air condition system completely on that property. My parents are living there, like I said. And the splitting the lots in two, in two ways, there was no reason to do it because they're both going to be facing Carroll Street or even Diana Street, and I still got to demolish the property. So why would I split it in two when there was no benefit? But if I split it on three, I can still build a property on the left side on partial A and wait, hopefully, one day Carroll Street gets improved and I can build a property on partial C. I have all, like I said, all the appraisal. Everything is pending on this uh, one point for reduction, so I can get the folio numbers and all the process, all the future future documents for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else, sir? Not nothing else, sir. Anything else for the applicant? All right. Move to close. Mr. Riero, second by Mr. Mariscal. Go in favor. Any opposed? Motion granted. Who wants to take a stab at the apple here? Anyone? Again, Council, um, Ms. Kamaria pettis mackel on the last page, I've provided you with sample motions as well. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, if I may. Absolutely, sir. In uh, the reviewing this case of BRB, uh, 21-123, I move to uh, affirm the VRB's decision to deny the variance request to the applicant, uh, the property at 1712 West Diana Street, because the petition does not meet any of the hardship criteria, as the, uh, I feel that the alleged hardship was self-imposed, and it, uh, it will, the variance will not fit in with the harmony and serves general, that serves the general intent purpose of the chapter and the adopted Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Mr. And Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Citro, just for the purposes of the record, and you're uh, referring to section 27-80 of the code. That is correct. Thank you. All right, Mr. Maniscalco is second at roll call. Vieira. Yes. Citro. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Dingfelder. Carlson. Yes. Maniscalco. And go. Yes. Thank Most, you, Mr. Chair. Motion carried unanimously with Ning further being absent at vote. All right. Thank you, sir. Next case, item number 81. Yes, Mr. Chair. Kamaria pettis Mackle from the City Attorney's Office. Um, similar to the previous item, this item number 81 is regards to ARC 21-364 for the property located at 818 South Edison Avenue. Um, sorry, as I stated before, this is a petition that was filed um, from the petitioner regarding a review of a decision by the Architectural Review Board. The, the applicant um, or the agent asked the uh, Architectural Review Commission to uh, request a certificate of appropri appropriation uh, for the demolition of an accessory structure. The application was heard from the um, ARC on November 2nd of 2021. The board denied the request for the certificate of appropriateness for the demolition of the accessory structure because the, according to the board, the application did not establish the economic hardship criteria as set forth in city code section 27-116. Earlier city council was provided a copy of the relevant code sections, particularly code section 27-116, sample motions and the rules of procedure. At this juncture, it's the um, burden on city council, it's city council's role to t take a de novo hearing regarding this matter, which means city council can accept uh, public testimony, can accept uh, evidence and determine whether or not the petitioner meets the standards 
for the um, economic hardship criteria as established in code section 27-116. Uh, before you is Mr. Vila from staff who can explain the process and the application uh, that was presented to the um, ARC. And at the end, at the conclusion of the presentation of the evidence, City Council can affirm the decision of the ARC and deny the request for the certificate of appropriation for the, for the demolition of the accessory structure. City Council can uh, remand this matter back to the Architectural Review Commission in order uh, with specific instructions. Or finally, the City Council can overturn the decision of the ARC and therefore grant the certificate of appropriateness to demolish the accessory structure. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Mr. Vila from staff. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. Just to uh, reiterate uh, on Kamaria's position, uh, this came in to our department on uh, September 30th, 2021. It was a request for demolition for a two-story accessory structure that is a contributing structure. This is for the address of 818 South Edison Avenue. The certificate of appropriateness request for a demolition of the contributing structure that did not go forward. And then they also had a new construction for the accessory structure to replace the one if it was granted to be removed. Uh, can I share my screen, please? Yes, you can, sir. Is my screen available? Yes, sir. We can see it. Okay, thank you. So on top, we have the uh, Sanborn map that illustrates the fabric in 1929. The structure is 818 Edison, which is here. This is the primary structure in 1929, showing the two-story detached accessory structure that's right off of the alley. So this is the contributing structure that we're talking about. This is the current aerial of the subject site. Property in question is highlighted in the green parcel, does face Edison. There is an alley that runs north and south to the back. And for proximity purposes, you see Bayshore Boulevard to the south. Have a couple of photos of the primary structure so you get an understanding of uh, the environment that's there. This is the front facade of the, of the primary, which no work has been requested for, but so you get some understanding. This is the south side of the primary facade with a detached accessory structure uh, peeking from the background. Going to the north elevation and moving around to the rear of the primary facade. Two abutting structures, once again, so you get an understanding of the environment. This is a abutting to the Before south and then this is a abutting structure to the north. Yeah. Focusing on the on the accessory structure where the request will focus on. This is the front facade that comes down the driveway where the vehicle dies into the garage door. This is a closer shot of the accessory structure. Looking at the, the lap siding, the casings around the doors and the windows, the corner boards and the gable end. This is the interior elevation where the uh, backyard is. This is the uh, abutting side, which is the uh, south. This is looking down the alley. The alley is uh, heavily driven. And a lot of the structures use the alley to come into their accessory structures. So that concludes the photo presentation. Um, along with the presentation, chapter 27, 116, where the board puts most of their uh, review processes into place, there's an economic hardship portion to that and a burden of proof. All of the chapter 27, 116 questions were answered completely and fully. That's why the presentation went forward. But after the board evaluated what was put into the record on November 1st, 2021, the board reviewed the information and denied the request for a certificate of appropriateness to demolish the two-story 
contributing accessory structure, specifically that the applicant had not established an economic hardship and the ability to renovate the structure had been established as being feasible. In the packet that was submitted to council prior to the hearing today, there is uh, questions to the uh, economic hardship. There's, there's two different columns. There's a column that states uh, the, the cost to rehabilitate, and then there's a cost for new construction. And that's where the board put most of their energy into uh, that performer that was pr provided. At the end, there was a $25,000 discrepancy on a structure that's almost $300,000 to rehabilitate and or to build new. So the board felt that their charge is to keep the historic fabric in place the $25,000 discrepancy from building you instead of keeping the structure did not warrant um, the, the ability to grant a positive certificate of appropriateness. And with that, uh, I'll be here to answer any questions. Any questions for the gentleman? Yes, Mr. Chair, please. Mr. Mr. Miller, what, what was the conditioning of, condition of the accessory structure? In the staff's opinion that went out to the site and through the board review with multiple uh, photos that were provided and that the contractor that we have on the board is that that structure had, could be renovated. Um, I, my, my question, what, what, is, what is the condition of the accessory structure now? It's livable. You know, you know they, they go into it now. I, Mr. Chairman, when I When I was on site. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, hold on, oh, I'm, I'm asking one, staff. One time, time. You said so? floor? I, I, I'm still, I'm, you, you say livable. Is there holes in the roof? Is the foundation bad? You know, is there, is there walls falling down? The, the report uh, comments that the structural stability, they have an engineer that's compromised and they feel that it should be um, reconstructed or removed. They have, they have two different paths that were submitted in the economic hardship portion of the, um, of the packet, addressing the questions in chapter 27, 116. And along those lines, there's certain areas that have to be reconstructed to meet city of Tampa code or remove the structure removed, which is the other avenue that they took that was denied in front of the ARC. Is, is, is one of the issues is that it would not be built to the same standards, to the architectural reviews uh, uh, standards? It, it can be rebuilt. Uh, we looked at, at a preliminary path, but the board was reviewing the ability to remove the structure and if it met the criteria. After the evaluation that was presented at the public hearing, as I stated, there was only a $25,000 discrepancy from removing the structure or reconstructing the structure in place. So it can be rebuilt in place and they could build a new one if they choose, if this approval is granted to mimic the structure that's there. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair, if I may. You recognize. Um, Kamaria pettis from the city attorney's office. Just to clarify, um, Councilman, uh, this is a certificate of, of appropriateness for a demolition. And the applicant presented um, evidence or information at the, for the architectural review regarding a demolition request. As I previously stated, code section 27-116 provides the burden of proof and information regarding the economic hardship. Um, it has multiple factors, um, A through M, that the applicant has to prove before the architectural review to determine whether or not the certificate of appropriateness can be approved. Based upon the information that was presented to the board, uh, the board denied the request to demolish the accessory structure based upon uh, the applicant not meeting the economic hardship criteria for the demolition. And I, I hope that just clarifies where we are in this process, why this is before city council. I thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may. Continue, sir. Thank you. I, re I, I thank you very much for that. But there are times when I have seen 
such organizations, such as the uh, uh, Architectural Review Board, Bar Latino, and whatnot, that it's cheaper to tear down something and build it to the exact specifications that are being asked for than to repair a structure. That's, so where, I was, that's, that's, that's where I was going. Thank you very much. That's where I was going. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Anyone else for the gentleman? All right. We're from the applicant. Uh, thank you, Council. Ms. I Warren, have. Ms. Warren in? I, yes, I've been sworn, but right. the other parties that uh, are part of this uh, application have not been sworn yet. All right. She'll swear them in. Everyone that. Raise your hand. Please raise your right hand. Do I'll be sworn again. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Let me proceed, sir. Name, please. Thank you, Counselor. I have with me uh, Ms. Peter. Ms. Malini, your name for the record, please, sir. Steve Michelini. I'm here on behalf of uh, Alexander Fisher and Peter Wu, the owners of the property at 818 South Edison. May I proceed, sir. I have with me uh, Peter Carlin, who is the general contractor responsible for the project, uh, Robert Wagner, who is the engineer of record, and Alexander Alexandra Fisher, uh, who is the property owner. Um, let me start by saying that the uh, we, we have supplemented the information. This is a de novo hearing, which means that you, you're hearing this as if it were a new case coming before you. And I note in particular that the variance, I mean, the Architectural Review Commission said economic hardship, ability to renovate the structure uh, and being feasible had not been established. And we, we plan to prove all of those issues are, uh, have been addressed and going through the criteria that's established by the code. In addition to that, we've reached out to the neighbors who are in the immediate proximity of this property. And if you look at the screen, I've highlighted in orange the support letters, and I'll be happy to spit those into the record. Uh, the subject property is lot 24, and the supporting letters are the other lots 26, 25, 23, 22, 21, and 10, and 11. Um, this building encroaches on the alleyway, and uh, a petition was filed for uh, relief from that encroachment, which was denied uh, and it was denied for a couple of reasons. One, uh, that there are electrical, heavy electrical lines that, uh, that are above this property on the alleyway, and it, uh, it would create a hardship. Um, we also have the burden of proof for the alternatives to demolition and relocation, as such as the planned districts. So we have a letter here from JVS Construction, which is um, a, a contractor the city regularly uses as well as they're recognized for their expertise in utilities, uh, housing relocations, demolitions. And I'll, I'll read into the record what they say in their letter, and this is a letter dated February 23rd. Uh, we, based on the conditions of the structure, we see no feasible way of salvaging the structure. Um, we have very, we live, uh, let's see here, close to the alley in the street, and uh, we'd bring in a crane uh, we'd have to put in 40-foot I-beams, fill in the pool area, which is existing there now, and the foundation removed. And they're estimating $400,000 to $600,000 to bring that into at least. Uh, that's just the structural element. We also reached out to All Trades uh, Historic Restoration, and they are indicating in their letter, and we, in this case, we find the ability to save this structure can, exceeds the economic and, and use viability. There are flooding issues, subsurface structural integrity issues, failing and failed columns, beams, as well as notable sh building shift. The possibility of a complete restoration to code would be prohibitively expensive to accomplish with the associated extremely negative conditions cannot be included and in possibly to save. And it goes on. Um, the issue of the encroachment, deteriorated structural integrity, foundation failure, lateral column shifting, make this cost prohibitive. Our estimate for restoration alone, this is not the stabilization, not the relocation. This has to do with just the renovation exceeds $550,000. The best solution in our opinion is salvage what can be salvaged in terms of building materials, demolish the structure, correct the subsurface voids, uh, relocate, remove the building and remove and eliminate the encroachment. And I have those letters which I'll be happy to submit into the record. 
So the burden of proof rests upon us uh, for the alternatives for dem demolition. I believe that the John Simon letter and the all trades construction letter address that. The economic feasibility has been addressed regarding the cost. They're estimating in total cost probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars for restoration and relocation. Uh, can it be retained on site? The answer is no. Uh, the letter also speaks to the fact that you would have to shut down major portions of, of streets in Hyde Park for, um, for back, back to the letter for a second here. Um, closing streets for one week for the crane. We'd fill in the pool, foundation poured. This would include uh, construction. It would extend over several months, not weeks. Can it be retained on the site? Um, you can't lift it because the structural columns do not allow you to lift it without the entire building being um, collapsing. And whether the relocation, this is all part of the criteria for demolition, by the way. Lo relocating the structure or structures that are appropriate and feasible, um, we've already indicated by those professionals who are licensed to practice in the state of Florida and the city of Tampa that it's not feasible. Um, they do plan to reasonably re reconstruct a building that is identical and is consistent with the uh, historic guidelines and the design, so it would be compatible with the existing st uh, structure, only it would be relocated so that it met the existing setbacks that are required. It would address the flooding issue, which is constant. We have a letter here also from <coughs> uh, a flood elevation letter that I'll be putting into the record as well that indicates that this that flooding issue needs to be addressed. The water comes down the driveway, goes along the south side of the building and deteriorates the wall and the subsurface. I also have a report here from USAA Insurance Company indicating that the adjacent property to the south has potential sinkhole or voids in the, in the ground which would have to be in, addressed by either injections uh, into the ground to stabilize or some other appropriate manner. It could require pilings as opposed to foundations that are typically handled. Um, they failed to consider the condition of the building. They failed to consider the encroachment that exists. They failed to consider the structural integrity, the utility lines, the subsurface voids. It's, also, I'm going to get to the letter from the uh, engineer who's indicating that the structure is unsafe to occupy and is, is posted as such. So there is no occupation, uh, no occupancy allowed in that building without the, the occupants being at risk. The economic hard, let me get to the letter from the, from the structural engineer. Where you have excessive shifting in the first floor and the drift is gradually increasing to the left and the right of the structure. The existing steel beam was not properly installed. Someone previously installed a, a beam to try to stabilize that. It's not anchored correctly and in fact is causing more damage. The construction of the first floor of framing needs a significant repair work. There's been a drastic increase in the shift. The homeowner should not, and I repeat, should not access the structure at this time. With drastic and con continued changes of drift and shift, does not feel the structure is currently safe to occupy. Um, the attempt to move, relocate the structure will cause significant damage to the structure, resulting in most of the structure having to be rebuilt to match the existing structure. We plan to build a new structure that meets all of the code requirements and, uh, and it will be shifted so that we address all of the other issues. Um, <clears throat> well, so we've talked about the current structure framing is not wind compliant. It's not, the windows don't meet the code. The carriage house could be habitable with structural sound, would not make it uh, structurally sound and understands the carriage house is listed as a historic building. However, in the all trades construction uh, historic restoration letter, they point out that the significance of that is not as dramatic as the significance of the main structure, which is being renovated and will, be, will comply with all of the codes. With respect to the uh, repair and construction that we went through, we have the, 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 contractors, the contractors comparison If you look at the, at the bottom of the page, 
the left, the left side is the repair and the right side is the demolition cost. I'm sorry, the right, the right side is the cost for constructing new. If you look at the top of the page, it's accessory renovation and accessory new construction. So for $260,000, we can build new. For $870,000, we can renovate. We also have extensive termite damage, and I'm gonna show you some pictures in a minute. They have the elevation certificate indicating that it is in a flood zone and is experiencing uh, flooding conditions that are deteriorating the existing structure. Somebody at some point um, put a channel on the side of the building to try to direct the water away from the, ex the accessory structure. However, that uh, did not work, and the water still flows through the south side walls and is contributing to the, um, to the deterioration of the, those structural walls. This is the report from, this is the termite inspection report, which also indicates visible evidence of damage, uh, subterranean termites, location of the garage, the framing and sheathing. So that I mean, this is just a, an additional confirmation regarding the deterioration of the property. This is the USAA claims report regarding the subterranean failure immediately to the south of the, of the uh, accessory structure. Uh, and you see what's highlighted, that's, that's their, um, their note there, it says sinkhole is not sustained, confirms that you <coughs> sustained a sinkhole loss. And that's immediately adjacent to the property. We also were requested to provide information regarding the cost of the home that the, uh, the homeowners paid $1,100,000 for the home in 2019. The mortgage balance is $905,900. The appraised value, current appraised value is $1,325,000. With the garage being added back on, the estimated new value of the property is $1,600,000. The real estate taxes that were paid in 2020 were $17,039.90. And in 2021, $17,169.41. This is the site plan um, and the survey showing you what the structure is that we're speaking about. And if you'll look at this line right here, this is the property line and the yellow that you see outside of that property line is the encroachment into the alley. Currently, according to the property appraiser's records, this accessory structure is valued at $122,000. Uh, it's 950 square feet, 460 square feet on each level. The bottom level is a existing garage and storage area. The upper level is, was a living area which currently cannot be occupied safely. We also were asked to provide a uniform uh, residential appraisal report which reflects the numbers that, that I just provided to you where they're in indicating that the home value currently is 1325000 and with a new accessory structure, $1,600,000. We have letters of support, um, and I'll read the addresses for you where, where they, I showed you the diagram of where they came from. Those are the letters of support for requesting the demolition, um, and that includes 816 uh, South Edison. Eight fourteen South Edison. Eight twenty South Edison. Eight twenty one South Edison. 
822 South Edison and 824 South Edison. There's a total of seven letters of support. Um, I think that I have covered all the letters of support. And as I said, I've gone through all of the criteria that is established, including the economic hardship, the cost of the proposed demolition. We have produced a contractor comparison for renovation versus restoration and demolition. We've provided you with the estimate from JVS contracting that indicates <coughs> that just to stabilize, shore up, and relocate the structure would cost somewhere between four hundred and six hundred thousand dollars. Which, if you use the property appraiser's value for the for the accessory structure at one hundred and twenty-two thousand, that is somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five times the value of the existing structure, making it completely uneconomically feasible to do that. It would cost an additional $15,000 for TECO to relocate their power lines uh, where the existing structure is. We provided you with a licensed engineers and architects report, uh, and we've referred you back to the engineering and structural report, which I went over with you just a minute ago. The estimated market value, we provided you with that information. An estimate from an architect, developer, and consultant, we provided you that from All Trades Historic Restoration, which was $550,000. And that excludes the structural support or the relocation of the, of the structure. We've also provided you with the comparison that uh, Carlin Construction provided regarding the cost estimate. We provided you with the information. I, just, I have just a few more things to put on the record here. Uh, we provided you with the information regarding the amount paid for the property. There's not uh, available to be rented or it's not income producing. The remaining balance of the mortgage, the uh, principal balance, the appraisals within the last two years, and it's uh, the taxes that were paid. The form of ownership is single family uh, from Alexandra Fisher and Peter Wu Wu. I believe that we've addressed all of the criteria that's established by the code, and we have supplied uh, the information that I'll be happy to put into the record substantiating all of our claims. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. The engineer is here, the, uh, the, the contractor is here, and the property owner is here in addition to myself. Thank you. Any for questions for this gentleman? Mr. Carlin, you recognize? <clears throat> Mr. McElhaney, this is some of the most, one of the most detailed presentations I've seen on council. Um, why do you think the ARC wasn't convinced by this? And if you were before them again today, what would you say differently or, or uh, you know, how, how would you convince them? I, I think that there was... Mr. Okay. Um, excuse me, Mr. Chair, and I apologize. Um, you Marty Pettis, Napa, for the city attorney's office. May I just um, um, ask, add some additional information regarding that question that was just asked by the councilman? Sure, you recognize. Um, regarding Exhibit C that Mr. Michelini presented to city council, Exhibit C um, is entitled Carlin Construction. What was presented to um, in this this exhibit C provides the information regarding the uh, cost of the accessory renovation compared to the cost of the accessory new construction. Uh, what was presented and previously provided to city council was a value of building total um, at the bottom of the table on exhibit C that was provided to city council in the packet from staff was a total difference of Two hundred and eighty-nine thousand nine hundred and fifty-three. That's for the cost of the accessory renovation, and compared to two hundred and sixty-four thousand eight hundred and fifty-two, which is the cost of the accessory new construction. This is the exhibit that was presented to the ARC. Um, however, I believe, and I know it's a small thought. But what the cost that Mr. Michelini provided to city council today, I believe that cost, as he explained, was much different um, compared to what was presented to the ARC. And if Mr. Michelini can just clarify that, that, that total cost comparison between the cost of renovation and the new construction, and it's in exhibit C. I'll be happy to clarify that. Um, some of the information uh, that I presented today was not available for that hearing. And what occurred was that when the property owners uh, and the contractor contacted me and asked me to try to help them uh, determine what could and should be done with this, 
We went back through the, um, the criteria that was established by the city and took a diligent time and effort to make sure that we had addressed each and every one of those, those criteria. And I think part of the problem was that when it was originally presented, that all of the criteria, at, le at least from, from the perspective of the presenter, uh, wasn't known at that time. And I think that they, uh, well, they can speak for themselves, but I think the problem was a misunderstanding about the, the detail that was required to obtain approval for a demolition. So I, and legal, stop me if I can't answer this question, but they were either not represented or you didn't represent them the last time. No, I sir, I did okay. not. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, anyone on the second floor to speak on this item? It's only our development team, sir. I, I have some photographs. Uh, let, let me let me, let me me hear from staff, Mr. McQueen. Anyone on the second floor to speak on this item? No, sir, there's nobody. Thank you. Anyone registered to speak on this item? No one is registered. All right, Mr. Maniscalco has moved close. Said by Mr. Uh, Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Who would like to take a crack at this? May I? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, let me get to the page. <coughs> We're almost there, Mr. Pierre. We're almost All right. there, sir. I'd like to make a motion to overturn the ARC's decision and hereby approve the certificate of appropriateness requested in application number. ARC 21-364 for the property property located at 818 South Edison Avenue because the petition does meet the demolition criteria set forth here, uh, set forth in section 27-116F-1-3. Uh, uh, I believe the petitioner has gone above and beyond in explaining why. Uh, I myself typically would not approve uh, demolition, what I deem a historic uh, uh, parcel here on this property. However, uh, due to the um, the quality of the structure, the cost to restore it, and the cost to rebuild it, which is significant, and of course it would meet uh, standards upon uh, being rebuilt, uh, and everything else that was explained, uh, especially the property value as is, the property value with the accessory structure, where that structure is located, which is on the alleyway, so the front house uh, would not be affected, which that is, I believe, the most important aspect of you know, what it is in that historic uh, neighborhood. Uh, having said all that, uh, that's my motion. Second. Second by Mr. Vieira, roll call. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Dean Felder? Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. And Good? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Dean Felder being absent at vote. Thank you very much, Council. All right. Oh, come to that time. Mr. Shelby, ain't that sure? Oh, sir, thank you. Mr. Shelby, let me say something to you, sir, if you don't mind. I, I got a couple of phone calls. I guess the, the paper's out already, Mr. Miranda. Yeah? Yes, yeah, out already. But let me, let me, you know, I speak with conviction and passion. I think most of the council members know that. I, I speak uh, hard time time, but it's not in a mean way, just the way I talk. I'm, I'm that old ball coach, you understand, Mr. Shelby? So I wasn't scolding you, so I was just giving you a little coaching, a little direction, kind of like when I'm on the ball field and the offensive coordinator, he's, he, he's, he's not giving it, giving it that, uh, that, that good play, Mr. Rand, I got to go and say, hey, do I need to take it over or, do, or you, you going to call the play? So that's what that was about. So no scolding you, sir, just making sure that you understand the direction this council needs to move in and, and making it clear that we, 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 we love that, uh, that you're here with us, but we just want to make sure that we get the advice we need from you and people know that we're here to do the people's work, sir. So Thank again, you. Thank I you, apologize if, if, I, if you were offended, sir. Thank you for that, sir. All right, sir. I yeah. never get offended by a ball coach. I know that. I, I know. You, 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 see, you're a ball coach. You understand it, Mr. Moran. I understand you that. You understand it. A lot of people don't understand that, that aggression sometimes. But it's not aggression. It's just trying to get the job done. Mr. Vieira, you're recognized. Whatever you want, sir. Your time. We, 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 wake careful. up. We had that time, sir. Cuidado, whatever you want. Um, and, uh, before I said, uh, a gentleman, Todd Vega, who was uh, with the Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Local 123, has passed on, and I wanted to uh, do a commendation off-site. Uh, and if anybody wants to come with me whenever it's done, I'll, um, I'll uh, just let me know. 
Um, and Brandon, if you're listening, if you could get with Jim Junico on uh, what would be the best forum for that, I appreciate that. Or Kevin Barber, whoever. Thank you. Second by Mr. Mascalco. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? Um, thank you, sir. And then next, we, we have been working on for a while, um, for, for too darn long, uh, for a marker with the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, which is set in Montgomery, Alabama. And, um, and uh, finally, finally, we've gotten what appears to be full authorization from all the different levels of government that we need for it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in fact, Friday, we're actually going with the portico, a few of us, uh, for what's called the soil ceremony uh, over to Montgomery. So I'll be riding with some folks to uh, Montgomery over the weekend, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. But I wanted to bring, uh, I, we could do it at the ceremonial um, uh, city council, maybe just a couple of members from our Equal Justice Initiative group. It could be Representative Driscoll, uh, Tammy uh, 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 Bryant Spratling, whoever it may be, uh, Pastor Glenn Dames, others, uh, to come maybe in, April or May or whatever to talk about uh, this this uh, initiative and, and and what it what it means for us uh, and whatnot. This this is going to be a marker, a memorial marker, uh, which deals with the history of racial lynchings during the Jim Crow era here in the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County, and recounting some uh, incidents that occurred. I think it's very important. The marker talks about these incidents as well as the Great Migration and a lot of really pivotal history. So I wanted a motion, if I may, for. Uh, in, in April, we can uh, do it and, and see how it works with everybody at uh, ceremonial just to uh, have someone, some folks come, and, and that's it. So I make that motion, if I may. April 12th. Mr. Mascalco, Mr. Shelby. April, uh, confirm with the clerk that's the ceremonial day on April 12th. April 12th. Uh, yes, sir. Fort Sumter Day. April 12th, ceremonial. Mr. Mascalco, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. And that's it. Thank you, sir. You sure, sir? That's it. You know, I can make a couple. You know, mess with you. I can you make know, a couple of Cuba you know, mess with you. I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you. Mess you. Mess You're Thank up next, you. Sir. All right, Mr. Carlson. Um, a couple times today, I mentioned the budget, and um, uh, last year there was a, a process. Some of it I thought worked. Some of it didn't. Um, but it was a, a great effort by the chief of staff to try to engage city council. So unless somebody knows of a meeting that's already set up, I would like to make a motion to ask the chief of staff and CFO to appear before council during staff reports on April 7th to discuss the collaborative process between the administration and council for creating the next budget. Second. Second by Mr. Vieira. Is that Vieira or Mayor Scott? Vieira. Vieira. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's it, thank you. Mr. Shelby, uh, on that note, we're talking about budget. Uh, we need to go ahead and clear up about the budget and finance committee. Uh, they're lagging behind me. There was a missed notice, no, you know, just a mistake that was made. But uh, you know that people don't understand that budget and finance committee—they they're under the sunshine. They have been operating, I think, out of the sunshine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things, you know, it, you know, and this is, these are things we're talking about. The city is getting bigger. Uh, questions are being raised, uh, and again, uh, not no fault of any pattern. It's just the way the city has grown, and, and, and questions, and, and, and the, these boards and committees have different duties. You know, just like the. The nuisance abatement and school enforcement committee. Now they're they're moving in a different direction, so we need to make sure that we uh, are getting that budget fight on board, making sure that uh, their, their bylaws, the rules, and something needs to come back to this council for approval to get them make sure they're operating. We need to operate to help this council, which they were uh, that that's what that board was supposed to do. I want to make sure we get that done uh, sooner rather than later, sir. Well, I was looking at the calendar, council. Um, March is very busy month um, and I know they want they meet they, they made a motion to meet monthly um, may I you can come back with something Mr. Shelby no time sure. today but just want to make sure that we get them on track and get them working since Ms. Carlson is talking about the budget we need to make sure they're uh, have the resources where they need to be able to operate okay I'll come back with uh, some uh, some suggestions on the next regular meeting I'll bring that back on Thank there you. Sure, Mr. Carlson anything else sir Mr. Citro Mr. Chair I move to hold a special called meeting of the City of Tampa Council on March 10th, 2022, beginning at 9 a.m. in advance of the CRA meeting scheduled on that time and that date for the purpose of the consideration of a resolution confirming the appointment by Mayor Jane Castor of Mary O'Connor as Chief of Police. 
Repeat that again. I, I got a little confused. It's okay. Sometimes we do. Sometimes yeah, when I, I speak. I wonder why the special call. What, what, special call speak? meeting before CRA next week. For a meeting for the consideration of the confirmation by Mayor Castor of Miss Mary O'Connor for Chief of Police. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Everyone's like, so, and thank you for that, Councilman Citro. Um, if I may inquire, um, are they have because I uh, six point zero three in the charter? Um, I believe, and gosh, Mr. Shelby, if you could correct me. Once there's the nomination, then the submission has that been submitted, uh, and then the fifteen days begins. Or, well, or? that's a good question. Maybe perhaps for the city attorney, what constitutes submission? Yeah. I don't know whether. Councilman Citro's motion. And, and that's what I'm asking is, I mean, it, not, to, not to inquire on your discussions, are you doing that unilaterally or has that been requested? If you can state. If you'd rather I've, not, I get I've, it. I've requested that of, of Chief of Staff. Let's move, let's move on this. I see. I so you see. You say you just want to go ahead and bring this to a vote. Uh, let, let's, I'm tired of waiting around. If I, if I could. I'm tired of doing the laundry. Yeah, yeah, I'm tired of calling them too. I don't know. Mr. If, but they need to, okay, so you talk, let me get this straight. So you talk to the Chief Staff, and they, they want to bring forth that item for us to vote on, correct, sir? Correct. And the point is, is that the reason why I'm making this motion today, we have to have due diligence in sending out notice for clerks, and and if we don't do it today, it would take another mm -hmm. two weeks. The 10th is, is it on Thursday. Well, it's on Thursday. Which is a CRA meeting, and the reason why I'm bringing this to you now in an open forum here you are city council chair. I'm city. I'm CRA chair. I'm saying that we'll start this first before CRA meeting. But there's 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 six members here, Mr. And Chairman. My only, uh, my only concern is, Mr. Citro, is that the nominee. And I want to make it clear because people may see that the nominee of appointment for the police chief. Because to me, this this board, this body has not confirmed a police chief for the city of Tampa. So no. the, the person that the, the mayor has elected. Uh, to be a nominee appointee to come before for conferral uh, to say before a CRA meeting, you mean at 9 o'clock and in a CRA meeting, I mean, that, that CRA meeting may, may drag on, so you may have a substantial number of people that want to come in, so that, that could pull the CRA meeting back a little bit. I'm just going to be honest, Mr. Citro, because I, I, can, I, can, I can assure you, <laughs> if we're saying it's about doing a confirmation on that day, this place is going to be packed. I, I, I'm not bragging on myself, but CRAs have gone rather quickly these days. Just saying. So, I, 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 wanna, again, I, I, I this, this, is, this has been a very contentious point. Yes, sir. I, I would like to hear from Councilman before I, I, I look at them having a special Mr. call. Ch Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, you recognize. I'm sorry, but Councilman Vieira's question has not been answered. Yeah, and I was wondering, right? Mr. Vieira. It's, it's is Ms. There? Grimes, you there. Mr. Massey, are you there? Chief Bennett, you there? All right, while we're waiting till they come on, uh, Mr. Carlson, you recognize? No, we'll let Chief. All right, Chief Bennett is here. Chairman, I. Can you repeat the question, <laughs> Mr. Shelby? Mr. Vieira? Mr. Vieira. Oh, yes, sir, and thank you. And Sorry, I'm actually looking at the charter now because I didn't know. And again, people make their motions based upon whatever origin that they have. So I, I didn't mean to intrude on that, Councilman Citro. But I didn't know if that meant that the administration was because the the charter here sex, it says 6.03, um, the mayor shall appoint and submit to the city council for confirmation. Uh, 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 certain positions and, it, and it's it's obvious that you all have appointed but has the submission actually occurred and then it says the city and again I, I don't mean to offer any legal interpretation I'm just reading quickly here off my iPhone the city council within 15 days after sub submission after sub submission shall confirm or disapprove such appointment and the failure of city council to act upon such appointment within said time shall be confirmation thereof therefore my question is two two part which is um, really one number one has it submitted but number two if it hasn't been submitted may we vote on it under this uh, charter provision uh, so so that's why I was inquiring in that regard that's it thank you yeah thank you thank you councilman again clearly I'm not the city attorney but what I 
of what I am aware of in the charter is that just as you said, that once the administration submits the resolution for council's approval for confirmation, which is what I understand Councilman Sintra is bringing forward. So if the motion is approved, then the city would submit that as the one agenda item on the special call meeting. And then as far as the 15 day clock, it, my, my understanding of the charter would be that it would begin at the time that that was presented to council. Mr. Carlson, recognize? <clears throat> I don't know when the best date to do this would be, but there's gonna be a lot of people lined up. It's gonna be a huge amount of public engagement. And, and essentially we would be canceling the, um, the CRA meeting um, because it, it could end up taking several hours. Uh, there are strong feelings in the public as we've been <coughs> talked about before. And we city council did not create that. I, I met with a candidate and I liked her a lot. Um, I also liked uh, Butch Delgado. I did not meet the, the third one. Um, but um, uh, there, because there are strong feelings on, on both sides, there's gonna be a lot of people from the public. So I think we just need to take that into consideration. The other thing is that as Councilman Vieira just read, the administration is supposed to submit the candidate to city council. And I don't want to get into detail and ask questions, but if the administration asked council member Citro, then it just falls in line with the count with the administration as has been done with press conferences and other things. The administration caters to some of us and then excludes the rest of us. And city council is a body um, that by the way staff works with the body that the legal department is is by charter obligated to uh, to have city council as a body as a client and not not play favorites to one of their clients uh, but there is a legal process that is a respectful process the way this is, has been handled all along has not been respectful of city council and I don't I don't think anybody dislikes the candidate but why does the administration have to disrespect city council and the public through this process? Now what's happening, it, and partly at our request, is that there's been this roadshow of strong arming the, the, the community. There are allegations about our emails being searched. Uh, in the last couple of days, suddenly we've gotten uh, an email campaign from the business community telling us that we need to approve this. Um, I mean, th this is not being handled in any way, like as I understand it, like the ones in the past, there's a respectful way of handling this, and there's a way of looking at it like a like a marketing push or a political push, as if we're pushing for something on a ballot. Uh, it, it, you know, contacting the business community, asking them to flood us with emails, is a disrespectful way to handle this. When all it takes is some phone calls, and I met with Chief Bennett uh, last week or week before about it, and we had a great conversation. I had a great conversation with the with the candidate. But why why is it that this process can't be it, it, in, at the very basic level, respectful of city council. It's, it's disrespectful in so many ways, and I'm just frustrated by that. Um, I, I don't wanna be against the candidate, but, I, but we have the public on, on both sides of this, and then we have a campaign being run by somebody within the administration that, that is, is at best disrespectful of city council and the public. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carlson, uh you know, we've all seen <laughs> and received all kind of calls. I mean, I've received calls of people I ain't never even dealt with. They don't like me, but have called me for uh, or against. Um, and that's why I talk about the charter in the process. It's out of balance. Somehow it got out of balance, be it interpretation or what, whatever. But we as a body, have to clear it up for the public. Because we've all been asking the process. And since the process changes, the, we're quoting statutes, it, it, it's the process. And we have to make sure we have a, a you know, we call the police department an SOP. You know. Sometimes people can interpret, sometimes it's just clear cut. And sometimes our charter is not clear cut. It leads for vagueness at times. I have a problem, Mr. Citro, of a special call meeting on a CRB. If you want to have that on a special call day or an opposite day, I'm all for it. But to have a special call day on a Thursday to infringe on the CRA, knowing that this is a controversial issue, will take all day and it will take us into the evening session, I'm sure, because you're going to have a multitude of people that probably be virtual, 
want to be down here. Uh, I don't think that's fair to the public. I want this over with myself. With, with. I, 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 let me finish. I, I want this over with myself. I'm tired of dealing with this, this uh, nominee police issue. It needs to be handled appropriately. I don't think, and I'm, just, I'm a chief of staff, I respect him highly, and I respect the mayor, but I publicly, I have a problem with, with, with the candidate, and it's not her fault. Her, her being designated as the chief of police of the city of Tampa without being conferred by the city council. I have no problem with the candidate going out, talking to uh, the citizens, communicating, but I do have a problem with uh, the, the person signing documents as a chief of police in this council per charter have not conferred that person. I think that's wrong. That is out of balance, Mr. Mr. Carlson, and you're right on that accord. But that's the administration. I can't deal with that house over there. Does. I only can deal with how this house operates and how we will operate as me being the chairman. But going forward, again, Mr. Citro, I have no problem with, with a special call meeting any other time, but I have a problem myself as a chairman doing it on a Thursday knowing that we have CRA business and infringing on those folks. With, with, with the utmost respect, Mr. Chair, I am chair of CRA. However, we all only have one vote. There has been a motion made and seconded. If we can proceed with the vote. We can proceed with the vote. Thank you. Let me, and let me say why. You know, the longer this process runs forward mm -hmm. against, the more this city gets divided. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to become the federal government. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to become what I see coming, and you got to brush off and keep going one way or the other. There are no winners and no losers, but on the process of nominations uh, or present presentation to councils, different people have done it different ways. Sometimes there's a, pe a piece of paper that they hand you, yeah, they give it to you, then two weeks later they come in, and there's 12 names, and you can, by acclamation, do one at a time or do all 12. And, and that's how it's done. I mean, uh, did I know this was coming up? Absolutely not. So I'm just as uh, at all as everyone else. But for the sake of clarity, going forward, it has to come to an end sooner than later. You're right. And I'm, I'm not saying about the process with the, with the CRA and, and this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, you've heard me say the old saying, it's like a dangling part of simple. Get rid of it because it's going to eat you alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just something that has to be done one way or the other and clear the air and, and let's go forward. This city is doing great. This city's in name in most of every things that I've read, and I don't try to read too much, uh, one or two in, in a lot of categories. And one of the categories that we have that's uh, astonishing is the crime rate that we've had in the past. It's been lowered by a lot. I don't know what the percentage is because you can dig a percentages any way you want. But when you compare our police department against any police department at the size of the city and look at the crime rate and look how it's gone down, I don't think there's none that can compare with the city of Tampa. And, and the citizens know that. Do we have some problems? Yes. And the problem is now that your crime rate may go down, but your murder rate goes up. For whatever reason, this is happening in every city in America. That's and that's got to be addressed one way or the other, because we cannot continue being the country that we are and killing ourselves for whatever reason. Somebody gets mad at somebody, they shoot the whole family, and then they shoot themselves. Well, shoot yourself. Don't worry about the family. But they don't do that. They want to take some people with them. And these are the things that I see that are just society has gone haywire, and not all society, don't get me wrong when I say that, but it's got to be a time and point where this city keeps marching forward. We're standing still in a lot of areas, and we got to look forward and forget what's behind us, because if not, you're going to fall and drown yourself. Last chance. No, last yeah, round, I just, I just want to say one more thing for the record. Um, uh, my legislative aide, Dossie, will attest to this. At lunch, I asked her to send a memo, uh, which I'm going to approve as soon as the meeting's over, uh, to council to say that for family reasons, I'm not going to be here next Thursday. So before you, I don't want anyone to think that we take this vote and no, then, then the memo comes out <laughs> and I'm trying to avoid the vote. I was planning on sending that out anyway. So uh, if it turns out that it's next Thursday, I won't be present. Mr. Dean won't be present next week either. Uh, 
Mr. Vieira? Yes, sir, and, and if, if I may very quickly, you know, I think the spirit of Councilman Citro's motion is that, that we wanna expedite this and get a dispositive uh, movement on this soon as Councilman Miranda said, I agree with that. Um, you know, potentially, potentially, we could take that time to talk about our, talk about our feelings on it um, and whatnot. Um, I think though to, uh, you know, I, I internally assumed that this was gonna come before us maybe March 17th, maybe March 24th. I internally assumed that without any discussions. Uh, so I, I think it's gonna be disposed of one way or the other. You know, as I've always said, this is part of a process and I think our duty is to be reasonable, to be fair, to apply scrutiny, et cetera. Um, and as, as some of y'all have said before, we've gotten a lot of input. I have never seen anything like this before in my five years as a city council member, not just in terms of the many, many, many number of emails, but from the wide group of people who we never really hear from uh, uh, on these issues. So, um, it, and, and you know, we have to be reasonable and fair, but in terms of how the vote will go uh, and whatnot, it's, it's, it's hard to predict. But I, I like to let the process work itself out with a stipulation that it will be done reasonably soon. But I think to mandate a time uh, uh, March 10th with the little time that we have is, uh, in my respectful position, not the best way to go, even though I understand Councilman Citro's intention, which I think is on point with regards to disposing of this relatively soon. But thank you. Mr. Miranda. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, and, and, and I appreciate what Mr. Carlson said, and I, and I believe what he told us that is factual that if he's not gonna be here on March, what day is it? 10th. Uh, 10th. The 10th. The 10th, and Mr. Dinkfeld is not gonna be here, that leaves five council members. That's correct. And I don't think that's appropriate uh, for the party going forward to have unity so that whatever we do or don't do, the public has a gauge on us, a thermometer. And, and, and I don't want this city to be divided any, any further or any longer. Although I have a second, I really don't want to take a vote on it now because if Mr. Carlton's not going to be here, Mr. Dickfeld is not here, I don't think that's appropriate. Mr. That's Chair, if I may, opinion. I tend to agree with, uh, with Councilman uh, Miranda. If we are going to have two absent uh, council people, uh, Mr. Chair, I withdraw my motion. And, and I would set it up, whatever this administration wants, the 17th or the 24th, and I don't know, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I haven't talked to nobody and, and just, what I see is I need unity. I don't need dissolvement of a fact. Mr. Bennett? May I, yeah, thank you, Chairman. I just want to address- I'm sorry, Mr. Shelby. I'll get you after, Chief. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead, Chief. Mr. Shelby right. had his hand up. I'll go oh. ahead. Oh, okay, thank you for Council's feedback, and, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the, some of the comments. I just wanted to make a few comments that, uh, in response to some of the things that were said. First of all is, you know, as the mayor made the appointment to bring and submit to council for confirmation by, by what we know as the charter, actually was put in for what was going to be today, but we knew that Councilman Dinkfelder wasn't available by his memo, so we withdrew the, the submission for the regular agenda because, as it's been said in there, we were hoping for a full council. I had nothing, no information that Councilman Dinkfelder was not going to be available after today based on this, this memorandum and, and some other conversations. So, you know, just to make sure that you understand that the administration was doing nothing other than making sure that there was a full council available and the first one that we knew of as a potential for, a, and, and of course in full transparency was a week from today until we heard those other comments. So the only thing I wanna make sure that is crystal clear is that it was ready to come through SIRE for today but we purposely held it back because we knew Councilman Dinkfelder's memo said that he would not be in chambers today. All right, uh, thank you, Chief. Let me, Mr. Shelby, go ahead and I'm gonna say one comment. Yes, Council, when, when, when this first uh, became apparent, the questions about 6.03 that Councilman Vieira read um, became uh, quite, um, the inquiries became quite numerous relative to the what after 15 days, what constitutes such submission? And I guess that's why I think it's appropriate that if we could ask the legal department to come on here so that everybody who is watching and every council member is aware of what constitutes submission. The question is, is it the filing of the reso with the clerk? Is it delivered to city council? Is it when the agenda is released or is it when the item is called up at the meeting? But people have been asking, when does the clock start running? And that's um, uh, one of those things that um, uh, people have different interpretations. So I just would like to 
the, the legal department to be able to clarify for the council and the public just so that question is answered in its opinion. Do we have anybody from legal? I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to be. If not, um, if not, what would be <coughs> council's pleasure to get that answer back, Mr. Shelby? Um, I, I suspect, I, I suspect, well, if it depends, I, the motion is withdrawn, so it really, it, it's, the clock does not start running. Can I just say, I'm not a lawyer, but, Mr. Chair. You recognize? My, my, my suggestion would be that a formal letter would come from uh, the mayor's office um, with the words on it that are in the charter saying this is our official submission and, and also, you know, respectfully, this starts the 15-day clock, something like that, so we have a, an official um, letter, but we need to find out from legal because right now there's there, it, this is another area of the charter that's not specific, and <laughs> it's not that we would want to change the powers. It's just to say what form would the the notice take. So I, I would understand that the resolution, you know, once it's submitted, and I understand what you're saying, Councilman Carlson, is what you're asking for is that within the resolution, when does the 15 days start? And in what form does the notice take? Um, and I don't know what the precedent has been in the past. I think uh, prior mayors have just put it on the agenda, uh, but, but that, is there any precedent for what form it would take? Um, is it a memo? Is it, is it something else? You know, what, what is that? You know, it, it would say like regarding this is our, I forgot what the words are in the chart, but this is our nomination or this is our submission. <coughs> All right, see so the attorney's on the uh, on the screen. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Can you hear us? We have it on. No, it's, everything's fine. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you fine. They, I guess they can't hear us. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, all right. Mr. Shelby has a question, and I guess Mr. Carlson has to follow up with that. If you heard the uh, the question already, if I can, Mr. Shelby, with recognize. All due, with all due respect, this is Council Member Vieira's question. Well, it depends. Well, and then I have the follow up if you like, but I don't know if, the, if they've heard the question or not. Um, well, my, my question wasn't really the legal. It was more so with regards to Councilman Citro's motion, which, as I understood it, it's, it's withdrawn, but it sought to have what appeared to be a compelled vote, compelled vote on, on Mrs. O'Connor's nomination. And my question was, may we vote on that if the administration has not formally submitted it? Um, and, and so that I didn't know if that was their way of submitting it. That's all. It's, it's just that it, 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 was, it was kind of unclear, but it's been withdrawn. So I guess the issue becomes, as Councilman Carlson correctly said, uh, how, were, how will the administration signify their submission? Will it be done in a letter? We hereby submit? That's all. Or Council, from what I understand, and, and, and certainly the administration can follow up. <clears throat> uh, it, has, it has appeared in the past, for instance, like when in the interim appointment was made and, uh, and the um, uh, solid waste person, uh, Mr. Washington, was made. It was done by placing it on the agenda as a resolution. And it, that's when it, it was taken up. But I, I could be mistaken or corrected either way. But legal department is here. I think, I think that this has uh, garnered a lot more discussion than really is necessary. Um, in the past, when something has been uploaded onto SIRE and appears on the agenda, um, that's when it's considered, quote, submitted. But Councilman Carlson's suggestion that we say in our memo that we hereby submit to you um, for confirmation the appointment of um, Chief O'Connor, I think we can do that. I don't see anything difficult or, or wrong with that. And if, if you're concerned that the administration is going to take the position that it's that it's been submitted and your 15 day time clock has expired and it's thereby confirmed. I don't, I don't think that should be a concern of yours. I don't think that we would go to all of the lengths that we've gone to to try to schedule this on a date when all of the council members calendars are, are clear. I don't think we would have gone to that length to try to schedule it for that date if we were trying to slip by with a 15 day automatic confirmation. So, but just, to, just to, to satisfy your concerns, what we can do in the memo that is submitted is to say the 15-day time clock is hereby started. We recommend. Yeah, and just to be clear, and I kind of said this earlier, 
um, I, I think none of this, most of this is not, has never been our concerns. It's been the volume of calls and emails we've gotten. Um, you know, there was well, could a period, you submit those to us, those what, volumes of calls and emails so that we could reach out to those people and assure them that we're not trying to submit something and allow the 15 day yeah, so that, that, I think you, you all addressed some of those I turned over to you a couple weeks ago, and you all addressed some of those um, because there were calls from the media and others about whether, uh, whether this 15-day rule, I don't know who was pushing that, but, the, but there was this, this worry out there. I, 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 just think, I think, as you've said in the past, that we try to um, be collaborative with the council, and so if you have a concern about when the 15-day time clock begins, then we can simply say, in the memo um, submitting the resolution for confirmation we can simply say that we hereby submit and, yeah and my and like i said my my concern was more about the sorry I, uh, my concern was more about the the concerns that were brought up by the community and the media but whatever form this has taken in the past uh, or whatever form we, we you decide to use going forward it, i think would just be the form of it and this one has been a long drawn out process partly because the route that somebody decided they, to take and the campaigning that's gone on behind the scenes. But the other thing is, is uh, because um, the community uh, it, what, was polarized on it and the, there were a lot of people in the community that are for and against and have given us their points of view. And uh, if not for that, it might have gone quickly. But could I ask, for the same reasons that my colleagues mentioned, can we just pick another day? I, it, it, um, and I apologize that I'm not gonna be here next Thursday, but is there another, is there another date and time that longer notice we give to the public, the better the public will feel about it. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shelby, you and I, I, just, I just want to point out that, <clears throat> excuse me, Councilman Dingfelder is not online and he's, uh, he's not participating now, so I don't know what. Let, let's do this. To be fair to the administration, this council, and the public, Mr. Sitchell asked for a special call meeting. And I got told everyone the police chief is the most powerful job position in this city. I don't care what anybody says. I would obtain a special call meeting because I, I really don't want to have it on the 17th on a council meeting day because we won't get through nothing on that day. So I would say let's get in touch with Mr. Dean from Ms. Shelby and maybe we can do it on the 16th on that Wednesday or something like that. So they do a week and that way you have a special call and that way we can deal with strictly the police chief issue. Because I'm telling you, if you put that on the calendar for the 17th, we already have a tight schedule. You have a multitude of people here to speak on that item and virtually. I don't want to. I, I don't want to do that to to the administration. I don't. I don't want to do that to this council. We want to make sure that we are able to hear what the public has to say and we make a decision. <coughs> so I can entertain a special call meeting, probably the day before the 16th, 15th, one of those days. Uh, and that way, Mr. Mr. Dingfield probably will be back and we probably have, could have a full council. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> uh, just uh, logistically, um, the question is, I know code enforcement meets in this room and it's noticed for people for hearings. I'm not quite sure, but that might complicate things also. We have to confirm with CTTV and the clerk that shouldn't, it, with enough notice, right, that shouldn't we'll look be. Look and see what date we have. We can we can always bring it back. It's a good date. We still have time, and you still have time to put a special notice for that, uh, for that, that that particular week. Who should coordinate that for that for that purpose? Because that's 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 to work with every office. I don't think it's a part of working every office. I just think it's part to see what date is this room going to be available oh, for see. us to do business. And from that point, we can make sure councilmen are going to be here that date. You know, before the CRA meetings, we vote on that or whatever, that night we vote on it, and then you put up that notice for a special call meeting. With a week's notice, sufficiently, hopefully. Um, but the question is, who who's going to, there's, there's multiple tasks involved here. In the what quiz. are multiple tasks, sir? Well, the first one is to make sure whether the room is available. That could be the clerk function or Tanya's function on the phone. That's the easy task. Okay, then the question is, the question is then, what council members are available because sometimes council members, I just want to share with you, when there is a special call meeting or is a contemplation of another day, council members have conflicts during the week. So you'd have that's to clear. That's an easy task, sir, that so, council members can know. We look at their calendars now. They can know. That's an easy task. Number three. 
Okay, and then just to make sure logistically that the, um, the CTTV and the other uh, and the clerk's office is available to go and that's I, an easy test. I think Mr. Bennett, uh, administration can handle that to see if they're available. I think that's an easy test. I don't see anything hard at this point that you indicated. Okay, and who's going to coordinate all of that? Just out of curiosity, Ms. Madam Clerk. Just to assist a little further, um, I can give you some dates this month um, where there's no meeting. We have March 15th, March 14th. Mm -hmm where there's no day sessions from any boards or committees, as well as March 21st, and I'm not sure how soon we need to have this resolution before council, but there's no meeting on March 31st. Gentlemen, can, can you get your calendars from March 15th and March 14th? I'm open all the days. To can we, I think it would be better for the public if it's on a Thursday. The, the reality, despite the fact that some of us don't like the process that was done, is that the the nominee is being presented to the public as the police chief and from the administration's point of view she is the police chief and and whatever council decides to do um it it, it unless um it, between now and whenever the vote is uh nothing would change uh so um it it seems like it drags it out longer but the 31st if we don't have a meeting because it's the fifth Thursday, that seems like it would be the best time because that's when the public would expect to show up anyway. Well, it's council's opinion. I mean, I'm not the only person. If council says the 31st, it's open Thursday. When we, when we have meetings 31st. on other days, the pub, members of the public <laughs> complain because they think that we're trying to uh, hold on a different day so they wouldn't know about it, even though their notices. Um, the average person in the public thinks about watching us on Thursdays. I think that's a long time to drag it out, but whatever council's pleasure is. Mr. Metascalco. Then I'd like to make a motion we have a special call. Uh, meeting. March 31st at 9 a.m. It is a Thursday. It is not a council day. It's, an, it's, all, it's open if it takes 30 minutes or if it takes six hours. Um, and, and this is in order for the, uh, to dis, the, dis, the discussion and the vote for the uh, police chief. Mr. Show. I, I'm just concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I believe there was a specific form of the motion that uh, uh, Council Member Citro w w wanted to, the verbiage of that. He withdrew. He withdrew it. I, withdrew my I, I know you withdrew the motion, but <clears throat> with regard to the verbiage of, um, of for the purpose of, because that goes into the special call, and I just wanted to be able to get that that down. How about he makes, uh, Councilman Seacher, if you remake your motion with a March 31st date? Be Unless totally you honest with you, Councilman <laughs> Scott, I think that's way too far. But, no, however, no. I will do that at slight the rest. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I move that the. Stop, stop. So, oh, uh, Councilman Dean Felder is watching and he will be available to be in person the week of March 15th. Uh, what about the 31st? Well, I'll have to ask him, but if he's available, then I would Bennett wants to Chief Bennett wants to Chief Bennett? Chief Bennett, you raise well, your hand? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to point out that, as I mentioned earlier, and, and which kind of comports to some of the questions, is that normally when Sire populates the agenda from the administration, kind of dovetails back to what's been questioned already. It was going to be put on there today based on some of the things we know and to bring in, bring this into a, a confirmation opportunity. But knowing that certain council member wasn't available, we acquiesced and, and said, let's not put it on there, which has kind of been the spirit of what the conversation has been. The next opportunity for the administration to put it on as a submission would be the 17th. And I would recommend, and I understand what we're theorizing about the complexity of the confirmation and and the the public engagement but you know i feel like the 17th would be the proper time to submit it through the normal sire process if the 10th is is not something that obviously was withdrawn as an opportunity mr carlson chief bennett i mean ultimately we especially because of 15-day rule we have to go with whatever you all request but i would i think it benefits the administration and the nominee uh to have it longer because um, it, the people who were against her were lobbying for us to have the vote a week or two ago. The people that are for her um, are, are increasing every day. A as she goes out and meets people, um, people like her, and we're getting positive emails. And it seems like, um, it, it, I mean, if, if we're worried about the length of time, she, you, she's already being called the police chief. 
And instead of getting more negative emails, we're getting more positive emails. So it seems like there would be more of a community consensus by March 31st and most of the negativity would have gone away. You know, I understand the balance there, but I also understand the internal dynamics of the agency that, you know, again, balancing the community engagement, which, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of the level of that and uh, balancing the internal concerns. I just felt like the 17th would be a good opportunity to bring it forward. If but we pick the 17th, I think we let me, let me say something, Mr. Carlson and Mr. Bennett. None of you I'm have sorry. been none of you have been over there and know how it is to work over there. Every day I have police officers call me, high-ranking officers that call me. They need to know who their boss is going to be. Police department is a paramilitary organization. It's like the military. It runs, it runs on discipline. It runs on rules and regulation. It runs on orders. It's how it runs. It's not like the civilian world and these offices over here. That's why people say, well, I, I, I think differently because I'm used to a military style organization, Mr. Render. I'm used to structure. I'm used to structure. I'm used to here's the assignment, get the assignment done. When it comes down, I may not like the assignment, but it is the assignment. Is it not, Mr. Bennett? Hmm. Is it not, sir? They're used to structure. They want to know who's going to be their boss. What is this council going to do? And, and, and I, I can go along with what, what council wants to do, but I'm telling you, this needs to happen sooner than later, and it needs to be a full council. I still say the 31st, yes, it's a Thursday, but the 31st is too long. If you're going to do it on a Thursday, do it on the 17th, and that means you're going to have to scrap some stuff on the 17th. Or make it, you're going to have to scrap some stuff because people are going to come here. I have no problem because 17 Mr. Carl is a busy day, but the 31st is too long. If we need to scrap some things, I have no problem with scrapping some stuff. Mr. Carlson, you recognize. Yeah, just, just scheduling. I think if we're going to do it on the 17th, we should take all these staff reports and move them to the 31st. I don't have a problem. I, I'll say I don't have a problem with that. Okay. So it's, an afternoon, it's an afternoon show. Do you, want, do you want me to make, do you want to make the yeah, motion? Yep. My colleague, uh, Carlson, who's picked in more like I am, yep. and uh, I'm starting to get worried now. <laughs> Do I have only to wear a black shirt? <laughs> uh, only joking with all of you. You've got to have a joke once in a while. Uh, I, I make a motion that uh, we have the acting appointed chief, um, O'Connor, to be here with a recommendation, of course, of the mayor that that's the choice, and I know it is, on the 17th of uh a march at nine o'clock in the morning and uh, to start the process of uh the conversation about the full appointment uh would that be the first would that be the first item first, sir? first, first item. item on the agenda Second. for the confirmation for the position of police chief all right mr citro has second that motion mr shelby you're recognized i just want to be clear take a look at the calendar just so there's no confusion then um this is the first motion obviously before we deal with the 13 staff reports, uh, moving those. Um, you have at 9 o'clock presently on the 17th, 9 a.m., a 10-minute a presentation from community partners, um, A. Brown Ministries, Chamber of Commerce, JCC. Um, I don't know why. I guess this is a remnant before we move things. Mr. Shelby, if we need to go through the calendar, scrap some things to move them out the way, we'll do that. Understood. Staff reports will be moved out of the way. We can move it down to on that, on that fifth Thursday. Anything dealing with accommodations or, or, or other type of activities, they can be remotioned for a later date. Understood. Council members can call those folks and, and, move, and, re, and move it. But the item number one item will be the police chief, March 17th, 9 a.m. If I may, sir. You're recognized. I refuse to move that. No, I'm joking. I was going to say that I, I actually, that, that was mine, the JCC, and uh, I, can, I can motion to move that to another month. I was actually going to do that anyway, so there you go. And, and the other one, I guess, is the um, Vietnam Veterans of America. Just we can, I don't know whose that's motion that was. Minutes, yeah, that's yeah. <coughs> that one. Same thing. Also calendar, a council, just so you know. Um, at starting or scheduled for any time after 9.30, I presently see on the calendar seven ordinances of second reading 
a 10.30 public hearing, and then you have, um, but that's it for the morning. Well, they may need to put those people on standby because it could get long so those people can know it could be a long day. Maybe we can ask staff to be able to notify people. Maybe we can, we can do that. Can we vote on this motion yes. and then we could yeah. do the next one and yeah. give it? All right, we have a motion on the floor, Mr. Moran, and we'll second by Mr. Citro, correct? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion granted. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to, uh, to uh, create a special call meeting on March 31st and move all the staff reports from March 17th Second. to the 31st. Second by Mr. Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Yes, sir, Madam Clerk. Does that include all of the ones that were continued from today to March 17th? <laughs> yes. You got the I would, Hannah project as well. The Hannah project. I would say yes. <clears throat> yes. I would say yes. We have to move it down. We have to say yes. This is this is this is how the city has to run. So we need to make a decision on how the city's going to run. All right. Any, uh, we left off, Mr. Citro. Anything else, sir? No, uh, we yes, just, one last. We thing. didn't vote on that though, did we? No. no. We didn't. Oh, sorry. Roll call. Please. On what the uh, the seventh uh, moving those we items? Creating the special yeah. call meeting on the thirty first and moving all the yeah. uh, staff reports. Motion by Mr. Carlson. Second, Second. by Moran. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Thank you. Mr. Chair and, and council members, thank you for hearing me out today. Please don't leave, Mr. Vieira. <laughs> I, 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 I just had to say this. On this matter, it was time that we stopped cutting bait and start fishing. And I, I, that, that, is, that is a terrible way of putting it, but that's the only way I can think of without using uh, four-letter words. My Chief Bennett, I, I, I hope you understand that that I made this motion because we need to figure out what, whether Miss O'Connor gets appointed or she gets rejected. It makes no difference. We got to move forward. A city that's not moving forward is going to die. Thank you all council members for hearing me. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. And I'm glad that we are finally moving forward on this issue. Nothing more from me. Mr. Miranda? I've got four motions, sir. Okay, Mr. Yavira today, I'm, huh? Well, I'm, I'm associated <laughs> with my, my best oh. few friends. <laughs> Motion one, the planning commission asked me to re make these motions. I request a planning commission to set an adoption hearing for TA slash CPA 21-14 for April 14th at 2022 at 501 and direct the legal department to provide the city clerk with the form of notices for advertising the public hearing. Second. Second by Mr. Ma uh, Miranda. All, uh, Mr. Uh, Citro, all in favor? Aye. Aye. He opposed. Motion granted. Motion two, requested by the Planning Commission to reschedule an adoption hearing of TA slash CPA 21-27 from April 28, 2022 to May 26, 2022 at 501 and direct the legal, legal department to provide the city clerk with a notice, form of notice for advertising and public hearing. Second. Second by Mr. Citro, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, motion granted. Motion number three, request, the planning, on request of the Planning Commission by setting a motion for TPA slash CPA 2123 and TA slash CPA 2024 for April 28, 2022 and direct the legal department to provide the city clerk with a form of notices for advertising and public hearing. Second. Second by Mr. Citro, all in, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. I would like to make a motion to request the administration to permit an honorary street sign in recognition of the legend, legacy of Phil Alessi Sr., who passed away on oh. May 6, 2018. Second. I think it's a great idea and is long overdue. Some may know Phil Alessi Sr. from the 110-year-old Alessi Bakery, and others may recognize based Alessi promotion that produce boxing cards around the world and earn him a second, they're, they're different classes in yeah. the Hall of Fame. This is about promoters. Second class, that doesn't mean that he's second class, that the notion is second class, inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame along Muhammad Ali, Said Muhammad Ali. The bakery was founded in 1912 on Cherry Street by Phil Alessi's senior's grandfather, Nicolo Alessi. It moved to Cypress Street in the 90s and is very successful venture. It is suggested that the memorial honorary sign should be on Cyprus between Havana and MacDill, but if granted, we will accept the application of the mobility department. Second. Second by Mr. Citro. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Anything else, sir? That's it, sir. I just have one gentleman. Uh, we've uh, lost 
one of our good employees and coaches. Uh, last week, uh, Mr. Corey Thomas Sr., Parks and Recreation Department, longtime coach at the Yellow Jackets, longtime coach. Uh, we had the Robles Park. When I, I started that program, the Robles Park Wildcats. A couple of national NFL players came out of that program. Uh, been around a long time coaching. Uh, gone too soon, gone too soon. Uh, like to make a commendation uh, for Mr. Corey Thomas Sr., posthumously, for a service to the city of Tampa Parks and Recreation Department. Further accommodation be presented to the family at the services on March Second. 5th. We have a motion from Chairman Goods with a second from Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Anything else, sir? That's it, sir. Motion to receive and file? Motion to receive and file. Second by Mr. Uh, Chief Troll. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion, motion granted. We're in this. Let's got go it. home. It's, <laughs> you know, you're, you're turning into a parent that's got a bunch of kids. You can't remember.